Bye. With the chimes ringing in his ears, Coles launches his effort to break a bicycling record and pedal from Savannah to San Diego in under 15 days. His 2,400-mile record-setting effort across the southern United States is dubbed the Spirit of America Ride, or SOAR. You can go where your mind wants to take you, you can be what your soul wants you, what you want to be. You can soar. Take a chance You can make it If you take a chance To achieve what you Know you can do You can soar Though the road may seem long And the end not inside You can make it the distance Keep on working until you make it right And at the end you will see the light At the end you will see the light Take a chance You can make it If you can take a chance To achieve what you Know you can do You can solve Hi I'm Rocky Blyer, former running back with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And here at Three Rivers Stadium, well, I had the opportunity to play on four Super Bowl championship teams. And it was especially gratifying for me, for you see, there was a time after I was injured in Vietnam that the prognosis was, I might not walk again, much less carry the football. Well, I beat the odds. And this story is about another champion who beat the odds. A man who overcame a serious injury, not only to walk again, but to soar. For Michael Coles, life is a gift. The ability to walk is a bonus. And to pedal a bicycle is a miracle. In 1977, he and a partner formed the Great American Cookie Company. Their goal was to make shopping at a mall more fun by selling cookies there. The Great American Cookie Company would not have been a predictable success. We started the company with $8,000. Uh, we had no experience in the food business. Uh, it was at a time in retailing that uh, we had just gone through the first big wave of yogurt stores in this country, and this was back when people thought that frozen yogurt was supposed to taste like it did out of a, out of a package, and it didn't taste the way it does today, like ice cream. And so all that first wave of yogurt stores that all started out and did very, very well in the beginning, all those stores basically closed, and shopping malls were not interested in looking at another fad business, which is what they thought the cookie business was going to be. And so we had this great business plan, and we had nowhere to open a store. Now, on top of that, a lot of people in Atlanta, I assume a lot of you are probably from Atlanta, when they saw our store at Perimeter Mall open, which is now almost 18 years ago, uh, they thought that we were probably one of the first people to go into this business when, in fact, we were one of the hundreds of people who went into the business two or three, two years after the industry started. Famous Amos, the founder of the industry, started this business in 1975. And by the time we got into business or got started to get into business, there were already three major chains that were in business. One had over 100 stores, two had over 50 stores. And so if you were a shopping mall developer, and you were going to give a lease to somebody in the cookie business, it was not going to be the two guys with $8,000 who have a, our entire background is in the clothing business. This would not make for a very good judgment. But the fact is, we struggled and could not find a location here in Atlanta. We knew we had the first store uh, here in Atlanta because we wanted to learn how to operate the business hands-on. 
And so Perimeter Mall at that time was not the mall that it is today. It had opened and done very, very well for a couple of years. Then Cumberland Mall opened up, and Perimeter Mall at that time became the worst mall in Atlanta. It was doing about $60 a square foot. The average mall, just an average mall back in 77, was doing over $100 a square foot. So Perimeter at best was very, very average. And we figured for sure we could get a location at Perimeter. I mean, they had a location coming up, and we, we got to know the mall manager, who was a guy named Jeff Weil, and we figured for sure Jeff would give us a space. But Jeff wasn't going to give us a space. And I, <laughs> and I remember sitting with Jeff and him sitting across from his desk and my sitting on the other side with my partner, and Jeff said, look, he said, I'm going to do you guys the biggest favor of your life. He said, you're not going to think so now. He said, but years from now, you're going to look back at this and you're going to say, boy, that Jeff Wild did us the biggest favor of our life. He said, because I really like you guys. And so I'm not going to lease you this space. <laughs> he said, because if I lease you this space, he said, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to sign a 10-year lease. The lease rent is $25,000 a year. You're going to have to sign the lease personally, which means you're going to commit yourselves, this is 1977, to a quarter of a million dollars. He said, that's a lot of money. And he says, you're probably going to fail. And he said, the Rouse Company owns this mall. We're a big developer. And we know how to really tie people up. So he said, if you think you're going to take this to a lawyer, and you know, if you go out of business, you're going to kind of wiggle out of having to pay us this rent, he says, forget it. He says, take this lease. And he reached underneath, and he pulled out a lease. I'm not kidding. It was about this thick. And he said, I want you to take this to a very good lawyer. And he says, I am sure that when you, after you meet with a lawyer, and this lawyer goes through this lease, you will not come in here and do anything on Monday except hand it back to me and say, Jeff, you were right. Thank you very much. And we looked at Jeff and said, are you kidding? Jeff, we're going to do so much business. We're going to sell so many cookies. He said, this rent is going to be a slam dunk. And Jeff said, $25,000 a year. Do you know how many cookies you're going to have to sell to pay the rent? And we said, we threw out these huge telephone numbers, you know, about how much business we were going to do. And Jeff just sat there shaking his head and finally just handed us the lease. And my partner and I walked out of there. We, you know, just left at three hours. We were really excited. And we sat down in front of the mall, in front of the store. And back in those days, Perimeter Mall had these big round tables in the center of the mall. And most people thought that was for customers' comfort. But what it was for was to make the mall look busier so that it would, it would push people towards the stores. And so we sat down at the table and my partner and I looked at the few people walking by the store and we looked at the location and we looked at each other and said, do you know how many cookies we're going to have to sell? <laughs> the reality of, of what we had done had set in and there was really virtually there was going to be no turning back. We signed the lease uh, and that was on June the 10th. We started to build the store and in 19 days we had the store ready to open. Uh, now, we've been in business, as I said, 17 years, and that is the fastest we have ever built a store. We have never built a store that quick because we're much smarter now, and we know you can't do it that fast. <laughs> so it takes us now five, six weeks to build a store. But back then, we did it in 19 days, and we were very excited about opening. And back in those days when we opened this store, people in Atlanta were very excited about a cookie store opening because no one really knew what a cookie store was. You know, in Atlanta, there had never been one. And so we had told people that in the first few hours we were open, we were going to hand out free cookies. And then, of course, just like you all are here tonight to get free cookies, uh, it attracts people and they made them want to stand around the store and with great anticipation and so we were excited they were excited and nine o'clock we put the first batch of cookies in the oven 300 cookies on one of these big revolving ovens with a glass window in the front so that the customers could watch this raw dough going around on this beautiful carousel oven and they could watch the cookies kind of spread from that raw dough look to kind of getting brown to finally getting to that beautiful golden brown color that only cookies can get to and the bell went off, which meant the cookies were now ready, and everyone outside was excited. We were excited, and we went over to the oven, and we opened up the door, and we had no potholders. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, we have trays of cookies that are 350 degrees, and you can't touch them. So 9 o'clock in the morning, there's really not many places open in the mall. My partner ran out of the store to go get something, rags, anything to try to grab a hold of these pans. And the people now, of course, out in the mall have no idea what's going on. All they see are these cookies continuing to go around, <laughs> going from this beautiful color of golden brown to a much darker color of brown, to black, 
to smoke, <laughs> to fire in the oven, smoke pouring out of our store. And we were on a combined air conditioning system with Park Lane Hosiery. And Park Lane Hosiery, all the people are running out of the store screaming because their store is filling up with smoke. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. It's just like it was yesterday. There's smoke just everywhere. And through this cloud of smoke, I see this figure coming towards the store. And it's Jeff Weil. <laughs> and Jeff Weil appears through the smoke and looks at us and says, is this what it's going to be like every day, guys? Their chain of mall cookie stores exploded to success in just six weeks. Almost as suddenly, tragedy struck and Coles was nearly killed in a motorcycle wreck. Instantly, this former athlete in karate and competitive weightlifter found himself at the mercy of doctors who were stunned by what they saw wheeled into the emergency room. He was in the operating room for four and a half hours, just putting the knee together. And when I spoke to the doctor afterwards, he said that it had taken that long because when he opened it up, it was like mashed potatoes. It was just, it took all that time just to figure out what went where. I had two doctors standing over my bed telling me that I was going to be okay, but that I would probably never walk normally again, that I would probably always need some type of aid, either canes or crutches. But considering the alternative of not waking up at all, this seemed like a pretty, a pretty good uh, resolve for me. So uh, I said okay, and I accepted that. The injuries from the motorcycle wreck led to a bout with depression. He was frustrated by the limitations placed on him by the doctors. But just when things looked their bleakest, he found inspiration in an episode with his daughter, Taryn, who was three at the time. One day, me and my father were walking up the driveway, and we got about halfway up it, and um, I asked him if he wanted, if he could race to the mailbox. And I was on two canes at that point, and I said, sure, and I took off to run, and I couldn't do it. The pain was just excruciating. He just said it. Well, Darren, I can't do it right now. And it was the very first time that I realized that I was crippled. And I couldn't, I just could not run. So it wasn't really his fault or anything. It was just bad luck. And I just said that there was no way that I could spend the rest of my life like this. I could not be limited like this. Because it was, as I said, the first time that I realized I was crippled. But not so much crippled in my legs crippled in my mind. This was the very first time in my life that I realized that someone had told me exactly how far I could go, and I believed it. Coles was determined to walk and run again. Against doctor's advice, he began an aggressive, self-styled rehabilitation program, including a stationary bike. As more and more movement returned to his legs, he moved to a regular bicycle for long rides in the country, eventually completing a long-distance ride through the North Georgia mountains. In 1979, I rode my bike from Dunwoody, Georgia, up to Helen, Georgia. It was 91 miles. It took me 12 hours. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I had to do the last five miles with one leg because my right leg's just cramped up so bad from the strain I had put on it. And as I rode across the Chattahoochee River, I thought to myself, this is unbelievable. I am so lucky. There had to be a lot of people out there who hadn't had the same kind of determination I had had and there had to be some way for me to get a message out there to let them know you just can't give up. And so I decided at that moment that I was going to try to ride from Savannah, Georgia to San Diego, California uh, to set a world record and use that as, a, as an inspiration. That first ride across America came in the summer of 1982. He bicycled from Savannah, Georgia to San Diego in 15 days, breaking the existing record by seven days. But he was not satisfied and knew he could do better, so he tried again in 1983. He was on a pace to beat the 15-day record when he crashed and broke his collarbone. A desert whirlwind called the Dust Devil threw him from his bike just 380 miles short of his goal in San Diego. Determined to set an example and a new record, he decided for one last try. Take a chance. You can make it if you take a chance. This third and final effort is off to a fast start. Cole streaks across Georgia. He pushes through the small southern towns as members of his seven-person support crew alternate turns and other bicycles to keep him company. News coverage of his ride brings well-wishers to roadside salutes. 
But in one town, Coles passes a scene that will haunt him throughout the trip. Earlier that day, tornadoes and high winds destroyed several homes and farm buildings. He is reminded of the power of the wind and the potential it holds for cutting short his record-setting attempt. I would have liked to have seen uh, no wind and uh, really wears you out. But if there wasn't wind, everybody would be out doing this. As the sun sets on the ride's first day, his body is strong and his spirit soars. In less than 20 hours, Coles pedals into a new dawn and a new state. He battles constant 30 mile an hour headwinds, but arrives in Alabama 30 minutes ahead of schedule. At this pace, he will be in San Diego in less than 10 days if the winds let up. But a warm welcome in Selma is only a temporary diversion from his growing concern about the wind. Coles is confident the winds will eventually ease, so he pushes back. Like building a cookie empire in the teeth of an economic downturn, he knows success depends on mastering the new challenge the wind is creating. He has trained longer and harder for this ride than any before. He knows he can win a short fight with the wind. He is not so sure about the 10-day battle. As he crosses from Alabama into Mississippi, he cuts through the headwinds to stay 12 hours ahead of schedule. But there is little reason to celebrate. In the Mississippi darkness, the winds continue. At daybreak of day three, the winds persist at 40 miles per hour. Jackson police escort Michael through Mississippi's capital and send him towards a major milestone of his journey, the Mississippi River. Three states behind, five states ahead, and Coles rides as if the winds are only an annoyance. He crosses the southeast in three days, but not without cost. His body begins to show the effects of the struggle. You know, you're dealing with no sleep. You're dealing with uh, physical exhaustion. It just comes and goes, but that's one of the things that's so neat about this sport, is you have to really dig deep all the time. An ultra marathon cyclist looks forward to only two things during the grueling days and nights atop the bicycle eating and sleeping. The sleep breaks come only when Coles can pedal no further. So far, he averages less than two hours sleep a day. That means countless hours of night riding and facing a steady stream of headlights that can nearly hypnotize a rider. The boredom is what kills you at night, because at, at night when you're riding and you've got all those lights in your face and you can't see anything, you just are so bored and drowsy. So, you know, you ride with some music and you talk and you eat and then you just try to make it through each night. In the morning, it's like the biggest up in the world is starting to see the sun starting to come up because you know that as it comes up, you're going to wake up. Meanwhile. Eating continues almost non-stop. A normal human eats two to 3,000 calories a day. An active athlete, up to 5,000 calories. But an ultra-marathon bicyclist consumes and burns up to 15,000 calories in a day. Which would mean that in a period of 10 days, you're going to eat a food, enough food to feed 100 people. Doing ultra-marathon cycling over this 10-day period uh, would be the equivalent of doing three-quarters of a million push-ups consecutively 
or running 26 marathons consecutively or swimming the English Channel 13 times without stopping. The black pickup truck that carries Michael's spare bicycles and parts is also his rolling restaurant. Crew members pass him high energy meals in plastic cups. The trailing motorhome is a kitchen on wheels. The food is prepared in the motorhome and passed to the truck from the truck to Coles. A symphony of precision provides his body with the energy to continue. Other cyclists who have heard about his ride through their local cycling clubs or bicycle stores are another source of inspiration. They join him for a few miles to say hello and offer their support. Everyone along the way is pulling for Michael to make it. He is on schedule to beat his old time and his old enemy, the wind. Let's go to New Mexico! Four states behind, four states ahead. Coles fights the wind and the clock. He enters Texas on schedule. Then a dramatic setback. In Marshall, the entourage collides head-on with severe thunderstorms. For safety reasons, a decision is made to sit out the bad weather in a motel. And as Michael goes down for a 90-minute sleep, the rains come. The 90-minute break in Marshall, Texas is the longest rest stop of the trip so far. But Coles discovers the longer the sleep, the harder it is to get back up and back on the bike. Watch says time to get back on the bike. Then Michael gets a boost. Texas television tells viewers about his record-setting effort. He's calling this trip the spirit of America ride because he says Americans can reach their goals if they try hard enough. Outside, the worst of the weather is past, but a steady drizzle and stiff winds remain. They greet him as he continues his ride westward. His seven support team members sense his frustration over his constant struggle with the wind. A discarded child's bicycle gives them an idea. They salvage it from a trash bin and substitute it for his racing bike. As Coles emerges to resume the ride, the surprise awaits. Hey. We've lightened it up. We took the chain off to you know, lose some weight. <laughs> we got the blocks on there so you don't have to reach down as far. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is better. <laughs> the lighthearted exchange between Coles and his crew lifts the spirit of the weary bicyclist and gets him back on the road and pedaling towards San Diego. He continues against the wind. And one of the great ways to lead people is to show them that you can have a sense of humor in a company and have, let them have fun at what they do. And I know that in the middle of my ride, some, at some of the worst moments, I found some things that were very, very funny that caused me to laugh and also helped me to keep going and I do that day to day in my own business. You know, my style is that everybody can have, have kind of a good time with it because it's just, that's just part of my own personality. And I think that in my own business it's the same way. I mean, I put a team together and we work as a team. We go forward as a team and, you know, if, uh, if, if I make jokes, they can make jokes. And, they want to make jokes at, at my expense, that's okay, you know, and uh, there, it's just the way that all of us have the ability to kind of get through things because business is very, very tough. What I did was very, very tough, and, and if humor is a way of energizing yourself, then it's a, it's a great tool to use. On day four, Coles approaches Dallas on a crisp, clear morning. Perfect cycling weather, except the winds worsen now more than 40 miles an hour. From the constant pressure, his neck aches severely. There is a constant pain in his knees. A police escort through Dallas virtually shuts down midday traffic. Coles pushes his aching body past the skyscrapers. Near the halfway point on the trip, he remains confident that just over the next hill or around the next curve, the wind will die. But this old enemy seems determined. The only question, is whether Coles is up to the challenge. In West Texas, temperatures approach 100 degrees. 
the rest breaks are now more necessary, and consolation from wife Donna more intense. Anita Volpe's muscle massages go deeper. Medical student Prentice Stefan signed on as crew member and driver to monitor Michael's stamina and the effects of sleep deprivation. The man's had maybe 10 hours in five days, and uh, it's, just, it's just amazing to me that he's able to keep going for so long. Compounded by the headwinds and sandstorms, Cole's physical condition worsens. He falls behind in his race against the clock. It takes him nearly as long to cross the state of Texas as it did to cross the four states of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. The endless hours in Texas have a negative psychological effect as well. So when the crossing into New Mexico comes on the afternoon of day six, a barrier is shattered. I keep feeling like this is a, some kind of test going on for some reason. I'm not worried about mentally quitting, because I won't do that. But physically, just not being able to go on. It's literally like somebody hitting you with boxing gloves. It uh, just beats your whole body up. You're having to ride the bike different. Uh, my chest hurts. My knees are killing me. I'm just pushing into the wind. I can barely hold my head up from uh, just having to just bear down to stay on top of it. It's very, very hard. The wind, the heat, and the climb up the southern tip of the Rockies takes a toll. Coles, at times, is delirious, dizzy, and is hallucinating. Concerned crew members force Michael off the road and into a New Mexico hospital for an examination. Doctors diagnose the episode as the effects of severe fatigue and recommend hospital bed rest. Michael refuses. The hospital staff offers words of caution, then words of encouragement, and Coles pushes on towards a new record. But the hottest and windiest conditions are still to come, and so is the most demanding terrain of the journey. From the moment Michael pedals away from the hospital, he is on a steep 90-mile climb to the ski village of Cloudcroft, New Mexico. And he makes the ascent against a 40-mile-per-hour wind rushing down the mountainside. With Cloudcroft behind and Arizona ahead, the crew rallies to keep Michael fit and focused. They work to keep his body tuned and his mind positive. I mentally try to tell myself that he's going to be okay because I believe he's feeling what I'm feeling. And so I just try to psych myself to stay up. And even if I might have a tinge of feeling like this is bad, I'm not going to let him know it if I can help it because I feel like he'll feel it. It's hard to hurt and keep going, and that's what he's doing right now. The other thing is the crew is very positive about pushing him along. I mean, we're all totally convinced he's going to make it. It's just a matter of when he's going to get there. Together, they push on, crossing into Arizona just after sundown on day eight. Hello to Arizona, Michael Cole. Hey, hey, hey. All right. Hey. Arizona. Two states. 500 miles to go. Until now, heat has been a secondary concern. The wind remains the biggest foe. But in Arizona, desert temperatures climb to 108 degrees. Crew members fear dehydration for Michael as he pedals across the black asphalt. His success in building his cookie organization has been duplicated in assembling a crew for this record-setting effort. In a spectacular demonstration of their preparation for the trip, endless gallons of water flow to Michael as he crosses this stretch of highway. Coles drinks from water supplies in the pickup truck, 
and at regular intervals, a portable shower head is passed out the motorhome to soak his body with cool water from storage tanks inside. Few would even consider crossing the desert in 108 degree heat on a bicycle, but to set a new record, it has to be done. And Michael Cole's crew obviously knows the best way. That's, I think, the key to being able to maintain your sense of humor, is knowing that you have the ability with the people around you to get through the situation. If their teamwork was not there, I wouldn't have made it. You have to have people who really are committed to an idea. They have to really believe in it and are willing to go forward at whatever the cost, you know, until it gets insurmountable. But everyone at that point, everyone has to agree that it's insurmountable, just like in a business. I think it's easy to see whether or not you have people who really are committed to the, to the plan, to the idea. And you can find that out early on. And you do that just like you would in a business. We did it by training rides, by going on lots of trips together, by going on 24-hour rides and seeing how everybody would work together. And we made some changes along the way till we got to that crew that left on that trip in 1984. And I think that's the same thing with building a business. You start on a business, you don't always wind up with the same people you start with because people sometimes lose their commitment or lose their focus on where the company is going and so you have to make some changes but I think in the end the people that you lead the company with just like you lead this ride with are basically the same type of individuals who are very focused <laughs> San Diego the name Michael Shermer has a special place in the world of ultra marathon bicycling he is a regular in the race across America the record holder for pedaling the length of America's west coast but he's along on this trip as judge for the American Ultra Marathon Cycling Association, on hand to certify Michael Cole's cross-country record attempt. But after days of watching Cole suffer through punishing conditions, his perspective changes. He becomes an unbelieving witness to an extraordinary effort. He is convinced Michael Cole's is special. And he's had more than his fair share of hardships on this trip. The winds have been just relentless in the the rain and the humidity and the heat and cold and it's more variation than I've usually experienced so I, I think that uh, that if Michael makes this and overcomes all these things that'll be one of the greatest achievements I've ever seen in athletics and in life then just west of Tucson Cole's body gives into exhaustion oh, oh, oh. A muscle spasm wrenches his neck. Every movement sends pain coursing through his shoulders and into his head. Oh, God. Unlike other breaks, the crew speaks few words alongside this stretch of Arizona Highway. Fatigued muscles are massaged. There are words of comfort. Then Michael is attached to a portable galvanic machine designed to bring the muscle spasm to an end by sending electric impulses into the neck. For passing motorists, it is an eerie sight. But to Michael and his crew, it represents the lengths they will go. As they put him down to sleep, there are unspoken doubts on whether he'll be able to continue. Perhaps Michael Coles has taken his body as far as it can go. Maybe the win has won again. But the decision to quit or to go on lies with Michael. And it is a defining moment in the life of a man hoping to prove that success is just on the other side of determination. When I got up that morning, everything I had in my life was right there on that Arizona highway. There was nothing else except the 200 or, 50, 200 or 300 miles between me and San Diego. That became my life. I had to cover those 300 miles, whatever it took. I think in the final analysis, what finally got me back on the bike was knowing that if I quit, that I would wake up in some motel in California, rested, and be very upset that I had quit, 
and I would do it again. I would know I have to do it again. And I didn't want to do it again. I never wanted to do it again. I mean, the, the one thing I was sure of, that I never wanted to go from Savannah to San Diego on a bicycle. And if that's, if, 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 if nothing else, I finish that ride, you just never have to do it again. And I think that that's a correlation that has been very beneficial to me in business because I think there are many times you get stuck in things, you just have to finish, period. After a six hour sleep break, the longest of the ride, the decision is made. The ride continues. The crippling muscle spasm is gone. There is still pain in the neck. With a brace, it is manageable. The knees hurt continually. Compared to the pain he suffered the night before, it is bearable. And of course, the wind continues. Michael's Spirit of America ride is now more than a race to beat the clock. Coles likens it to overcoming a test in life. Meet the challenge or face repeating it. He digs deep to stay on record pace because he knows he does not want to face this challenge again. You gotta finish. I mean, if you don't finish, then there was no point in starting. I mean, unless you just can't physically finish. And I'm not at that point yet. I mean, I've, I keep thinking sometimes I am, but somehow I managed to get back on the bike. Because of the wind, the California border seems to move further and further from his reach. At times, it seems Coles is pedaling without going forward. But by sunset of day 10, he crosses his final state line. Inch by inch. <laughs> the next day dawns full of promise. By daybreak, Michael is pushing closer to his final obstacle, the trailing edge of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It is all that separates him from the Pacific Ocean. But Mother Nature saves her biggest test for last. As Coles climbs the first of a series of 4,000 foot California peaks, the headwinds increase. The ocean winds swirl up and over the mountains and come crashing down on him at 70 miles an hour. In the canyons between the peaks, cars and trucks struggle to stay on the road. In the balance between victory and defeat, Michael gets off his bicycle. Not to quit, but to walk. On foot, he overcomes his final hurdle and literally pushes his bicycle into the wind in defiance. The wind became an incredible force in my life to beat. It became a challenge that I knew that if I could beat the wind, this time that I would never look at anything ever again the same way and there's no doubt that it changed my life forever. I had 70 mile an hour headwinds and virtually you could not pedal forward and I had to get off the bike and I had a that was once again a moment to make a decision whether or not to just quit because it was inhuman to try to ride the bike in the wind and so I started to walk and at that point I realized how determined I was to finish. And I remember actually laughing about it, thinking to myself, am I really going to walk the last, you know, 40 miles or so to San Diego and how many hours is that going to take? But I really realized how serious I was about finishing. And as an entrepreneur, uh, someone who had been involved in a lot of companies and a lot of starting a lot of divisions, I really had never had the opportunity to really see something to the end or see something to go to other than from, let's say, starting and building and opening, ever really seeing it reach the next level. At that point in my life, it was a, it was a place that I had never really had to go to before because I really had figured by seven years into the cookie business, I probably would have sold it or had moved on and done something else. And now I wasn't so determined to sell it. Now I was more determined to really build the company, to really see the company reach the next plateau. It seems to somehow make sense, but just over the California mountain range, on the downhill run across the final dozen miles into San Diego, the wind stops, quits, as if to surrender and say, okay, you win. The man who sidestepped thunderstorms, ignored relentless pain, and survived the heat makes his final strokes to the courthouse steps and they are the sweetest ever.
He has beaten the wind. He arrives at the San Diego courthouse steps 11 days, 8 hours, and 15 minutes after he began, shattering the old record by more than four days. Michael Coles, successful Atlanta businessman, husband and father of three, a man doctors once feared might never walk normally again, on Tuesday, May 15, 1984, becomes the fastest man to ever cross the southern United States on a bicycle, a true champion who is determined not to quit, but to soar. The great thing about my 84 ride for me was that the moment it was over, it was over. The moment I finished, it became the history, it became my past. And I began to focus on my future again. And it was interesting because in business, that's really what you have to do. It's great to have accomplishments and it's great to do things that you haven't done before. But once you do them, you just have to take the knowledge with you and then move on to other things. You can't live with that particular success. I was very surprised at how the impact and the importance that it had in my life uh, to, to have refocused my life in, in many, many ways, to change my life in so many ways. I had no idea when I left Savannah the impact that the ride would have had by the time I got to San Diego. But the Spirit of America ride set more than an athletic record. It triggered explosive growth at the Great American Cookie Company, now with hundreds of stores worldwide and annual sales approaching $100 million. The extraordinary efforts of a true champion who was determined not to quit, but to soar. You will know why you set your sights so high. You are there, and this is the reason why You can go where your mind wants to take you can be What your soul wants you, what you want to be You can soar Take a chance, you can make it if you take a chance to achieve what you know you can do. You can soar, 